Honorable Minister for Minority Affairs, Sri John Burlaji, the chief guest of today's inaugural session, Sri Krishna Kumarji, respected president of the minority Morsha of the state, Sri Chiji Joseph, Secretary Sri Joseph Padomaran, National Minority Morcha Vice President Sri Noble Matthew, Patma Sri Shoshama, whom the Minister honored just before. My fellow XY Chancellors, Professor Dr. G. Gobakumarji, Dr. Abdul Salam Sai, distinguished and invited delegates, Vicar General of the Bethany Diocese, from the Secretary General of the Kerala Catholic Bishops Conference, Dr. Joseph Mark Thomas Metropolitan, especially delegated on behalf of him, other Reverend Fathers and Sisters, heads of educational institutions, principals, directors, headmasters, and last year's teachers are gathered here. Sri Amit Kumar was wonderfully moderated the morning session on schools and the potential possibilities of the national education policy on that count. I hope that he is a potential future Vice Chancellor also. We have heard Sri Vinodji and Sri Manoj Takurji in the morning in the session. How beautifully they have explained the possibilities of the formal and the non-formal sectors of education which can benefit by the new national education policy. And I also would like to express my thanks to the minority Morcha of Kerala came forward to organize this kind of a conclave to discuss the National Education Policy 2020. May I also, as the chairman of the organizing committee, add a word of hearty welcome to one and all present here to bless and honor our conclave on the NEP. The Reader's Digest Encyclopedic Dictionary defines conclave as a private assembly convened for a special and specific purpose it relates the word to the meeting of cardinals in Rome to elect a new pope. It is from that assembly, private assembly, that the word conclave has emerged and found a place 
in the dictionary. The concise Oxford dictionary also goes almost in tune with that, explaining it as a law in conference, so confidential. So this is not for any wide publicity, but it is an in-camera session in fact, which is discussing threadbare, the positive and the negative, so the NEP, and also to realize the potential or the possibilities that the national education policy offers to the educational scenario in India. And we find that this meeting has become a very meaningful country because the participants are selective, restricted, and limited to those specially designated to discuss and deliberate the specific issue of national importance of the current days, namely the National Education Policy 2020. You and me live in a world which is very fastly changing very fast change. Changes are happening around us in unbelievable speed and in unimaginable dimensions. The question confronting us all is whether we are acute enough to keep pace with the changing tunes of transition and transformation. The conventional concept of education was that education was consisting of three factors, information, formation, and transformation. The emphasis is on the last, transformation the change that is to happen as a result of education. So change is the point. It is on that count that the government has come forward almost after 30 years of a lapse proposing reforms that has become so essential because the world has changed so fast. We find that just after our independence, there was Dr. Ratha Krishnan Commission, followed by Dr. Mudiliar Commission, again Dr. Kothari Commission. Then during Morarji Deshai's time, the Ajarya Murthy Commission, Ajarya Rama Murthy Commission. Then Rajiv Gandhi's education policy, and now we are gifted with a new education policy taking into account the changes that has happened in the world during the last 30 years. This is inevitable. I'm happy to say that nobody ever said during the previous government's times, from Nehru's time, to Manmohan's since time. That whenever a reform was made in education, that is a Congress reform. Now this is also a national reform. We find that this time also educational experts had been designated to prepare the draft. In the morning session, some of the respected delegates have been pointing out that there was not enough 
deliberation done before the draft was published. It was wrong. The draft was prepared by eminent scientists, scholars, a panel led by Dr. Kasturi Rangel. So the national education policy is not a political manifesto. It is an educational manifesto, taking into account India's great ancient heritage or cultural past, our social engineering realities. All this has been taken into account before this draft education policy has been formulated by the government. But we know that only by the government, any government, which runs the administration of the country alone can prepare a policy which can be implemented properly. So we have to national education policy 2020 promulgated by the government of India two years before, as we know before the Corona came. To be fair on our part, to be fair on our part, educate those who are working with educational area, at least to give a concession till it is fully implemented. That as it is, the national education policy appears to be a seriously genuine effort on the part of the government to help India to march forward, ensuring a deserving place in the very front line of our fellow nations. We have no other option. Even in the distant past, India was enjoying a place of predominance in the area of learning and education was drawing large number of students from different parts of the world to India. Then came a period and phase which witnessed a flow of students from India to other countries, to other parts of the world. Now the very world has become a cooperative global reality and no nation or region can live in an isolated island. As a teacher for more than 55 years, I see the national education policy just as a teacher. Leave aside having been my chancellor in three universities. That is my teacher. I'm a teacher, principally a teacher. It is a daring vision of the government, to be fair to the government. A daring vision plan, I must say, or a blueprint, at least a serious attempt on the part of the government to bring it to bring a drastic change in our sphere of learning. For God's sake, I must say, let us not blindly brand this as a BJP plan. It is a national plan. National plan drafted by the experts and because we live in a democracy bound by the government to implement. We must look it on that way as a very positive attitude. This is a national plan. Of course, envisaged by the government, naturally, no doubt. Because in a democracy, it is and it should be initiated by 
a government in power elected by the people. Make India is not anything new, nor an idea which came out of the blue. It is certainly a governing plan and policy scheme of the government and of the nation. And that government as it is happens to be the government of the largest democracy in the world. In Esther years, world leaders were normally from America, Britain, Soviet Union or France. Now the world hails and prays Pope Francis as the world leader of the first order. I am happy and proud that the world considers our Prime Minister Modi as the one who stands next to the Pope in that rating, rating for the world. This is no small achievement. India has to be proud of this. The Christian minority from which the Honorable Minister also hates me is proud of our Pope naturally and equally proud of our Prime Minister. And it is high time that we leave aside, I'm referring about the minority communities in the country, leave aside our campaign prejudices, campaign prejudices against a government elected by the people. Let us stop judging a government or a ruling alliance on the tailored campaigns of the opposition alone, on their blind hatred towards the government. And we naturally can understand that the opposition will be disappointed when an electoral defeat comes. That is natural in a democracy. Governments have to change if the people wants a change of government or a change of policy. I believe a day, time has come now to the minorities, particularly to the Christian minority, as I also belong to that, and as I also represented the minority Christian community in the National Commission for Minority Educational Institutions. I know that a time has come to have a review of the current political map of India and probe the possibilities of having an open mind and see the realities of India's current political scenario. Health and education are of prime areas of service as far as the Christian minority is concerned. These two sectors and no government can go blind on the share of sacrifice made by the Christian community in our freedom struggle and the very substantial role played by the Christian community in general and the Christian institutions in particular, educational and health institutions in making what it today 
So in the making of India, definitely the Christian contribution also has to be noted by the government and the government should also try to maximum ensure the cooperation and support of the minority Christian community. The Christian community has always emphasized both in health sector as also in educational sector. The uplifting of the marginalized and the downtrodden whom Gandhiji called as the Daridira Narayana. The Christian institutions, the Christian hospitals, all had been doing that job to uplift the Daridira Narayana. And the key role played by the Christian educational institutions and healthcare centers of the first order quality wise and in the range of service I say. Many of the class institutions the country is having today whether in the school sector, college sector or university sector, whatever be the nature of the sector. Undoubtedly, I may repeat, undoubtedly, the contribution of the Christian churches and the Christian minority community, which the government also must realize, it's a historical fact, and the Christian community, we are all happy that the Prime Minister, while in Rome, as it was already mentioned, he cared to meet after the summit only the Pope. No other separate meeting with any of the heads of states who attended the summit. And the Pope also had granted audience only to Modi except the American president. Only these two were given. Out of the 20 heads of European countries, Pope also received only these two world leaders. And I am sure that our Dear and Honorable Minister will convey the dream of the Christian minority community in the country that Pope should be received in India as a return gesture of goodwill that the Pope has done to our Prime Minister while in Rome. We will be happy, the Honourable Minister conveys this at the earliest and if possible, I may say, if it, is, if it happens earlier, it is well and good, otherwise let the Minister convey the wishes of the Christian community that His Holiness the Pope must be invited as the chief guest in the next Republic Day. That would be the greatest honour which the government can extend to the Christian minority community which had lived in peace, in fellowship, in brotherhood with the majority community in India for the last 2,000 years. We often say that the constitution has given us all these guarantees. It is only 70 years that the constitution has come into force. I am coming from a place called Palai where our cathedral church is 1,050 years old. 1,050 years old. It was not built by the Christian families. When a few Christian families who had to walk up 17 kilometers 
every Sunday to attend service in Kurvalingat church, Parve church. The Hindu ruler of Meenachi, Meenachi Karta, he gave six acres of land free and also the necessary timber to build the church. It is that church the Hindu ruler had built in Palai still remains as the Vajrapalli of the big church which is called the Cathedral of Palai. This is not an isolated incident. If we count 10,000 churches, suppose 10,000 churches we have more than 100 years old out of which I am sure 90 churches will be built by the Hindu rulers or the Hindu chieftains or the regions who gave it free. So I have no hesitation in saying that constitution is not the guarantee. It is the secular mind of the rulers. <laughs> secular mind of the rulers that will give the guarantee for the freedom of worship. And that is the most noble quality that the Hindu rulers have extended to their Christian subjects in Kerala, which we can be proud of. I'm not standing because the minister may be hard to go, but I thought that these are all clear facts, truths of history, which has to be made aware, not only the government, but also to ourselves, that India is a country which has been made, we too, made by the Christian minority too, by giving their social, political, educational, health contributions in various fields. India is our first priority, I'm concluding. For Christians also, India should be the first priority, I'm assuming. My father had been a freedom fighter. He was jailed for nearly four years during the British period by the Diwan. But he was also a member, immediately after independence, he became a member of the Constituent Assembly of India, which drafted the Constitution. Along with Father Jerome de Sousa, C. John Philippos, and he was free, half a dozen Christian members in the Constituent Assembly. So India has to be our priority. We are Indians, born in India. And our priority is India's sovereignty, India's democracy, its citizenship, its pride, its cultural heritage, and its spiritual identity. All these are ours too. We also have contributed for that. That is why we believe that India's secularism is not a political secularism, it is a spiritual secularism. Because India is a land of spirituality. Politics has come for relate. Archbishop of blessed memory, Archbishop Cyril Marbesedius, I remember, I was also a member of the delegation which met the then RSS chief in 2004 when I was vice chancellor because I was the vice chairman of the Catholic Council of India also at the time. He told the RSS chief that the Indian Christians, he said, the Indian Christians are Indians by birth. Christians by faith and Hindus by culture. That is what he said. I believe that it is 
a true picture of the Christian tradition, of the Christian national nobility about which we are all proud of. As a citizen of India, I was happy when the Citizenship Act came. Because we know that it is a minimum requirement for even a cooperative society that there must be a register of members. The Bible tells us that St. Joseph and Holy Mary had to travel along from their place to Bethlehem, to Nasser, to register their name in the census. There must be, there is nothing wrong in having a register of citizens. It is a historical fact in all countries it was prevalent. And we all know those who are, I am a student and a teacher of political science, Dr. Gopu Kumarji also comes from political science branch. He also knows cash. Can you imagine how much of funds have been pipelined to Kashmir during the last 20 years? And also to the Northeast. How much amount of money has been assigned by the government of India? Different times. If 10% of that money had actually been spent in those places, in Kashmir as well as in Northeast. No Adangavadi would have been there either in Kashmir or in the Northeast. It was all taken by the middlemen, the political brokers during the last 70 years. And that is why we had to cancel the provision of the Constitution as far as Kashmir is concerned. I have no personal reservation about one nation, one election theory that will definitely reduce the huge election expenses which a country like India cannot afford to. Every time election, every day by election, different levels. America had been practicing these one nation, one election for the last 200 years. Why not we also try? I'm not saying that a constitutional amendments, amendment must be immediately made, but I'm only saying that there is nothing wrong if the government, if the parliament is preparing a bill for that. And also we find that uniform civil code may be controversial. Uniform civil code is a must in every civic society. We always say that the constitution has to be preserved in spirit. And we find in the constitution, in the directive principles, it is a sanctified principle that the government should try to bring a uniform civil code. In no democracy, A personal law should be about the civic law. That is the essential basic principle of rule of law. All should be equal. All other laws should be only secondary to the civil law. That is what we find experience in America, in Europe, in all continents we find that why not be as per the direction of the constitution? I'm proud that my father and his colleagues from the Christian community also were a party to include the provision in the directive principles. So my request is a time has come to review our old stands, old prejudices. We have to correct our own prejudices. India is also marching forward. The world is also marching forward. Our own village communities are marching forward. So
So we have to make that kind of a reconfirmation that we believe in the constitution, we believe in the rule of law, we believe in the rights of all citizens under that sacred constitution. I am sure that this conclave, as I say, going with the dictionary meaning, this solemn meeting after the conclusion in the evening will definitely be a landmark, at least in promoting or provoking a rethinking in our minds. What should be the India of ours in the days ahead? And what should be the role of the Christian minority, all the minorities? particularly the Christian minority in that new India that is to emerge. God bless you. Thank you.